in the dark shadows, in the white cold. Fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the Abracast. We are the brave and the bold. James Taggart caught him in mid-step to say uncertainly and loudly, Mr. Thompson, may I present my sister, Miss Dagny Taggart? So nice of you to come, Miss Taggart, said Mr. Thompson, shaking her hand as though she were another voter from back home whose name he had never heard before. Then he marched off briskly. Where's the conference, Jim? She asked and glanced at the clock. There's a huge white dial with a black hand slicing the minutes like a knife moving towards the hour of eight. I can't help it. I don't run this show, he snapped. Eddie Willers glanced at her with a look of bitterly patient astonishment and stepped closer to her side. A radio receiver was playing a program of military marches broadcast from another studio half drowning the fragments of nervous voices of hastily aiming steps of screeching machinery being pulled to focus upon the drawing room set. Stay tuned to hear Mr. Thompson's report on the world crisis at 8 p.m. cried the martial voice of the announcer from the radio receiver when the hand on the dial reached the hour of 7.45 Step on it, boys, snapped Mr. Thompson while radio burst into another march. It was 7.50 when Chick Morrison, the morale conditioner who seemed to be in charge, cried, All right, boys and girls, all right, let's take our places. Waving a bunch of notepaper like a baton towards the light-flooded circle of armchairs. Mr. Thompson thudded down the... Uh, upon the central chair in the manner of grabbing a vacant seat in a subway. Chick Morrison's assistants were herding the crowd towards the circle of light. A happy family, Chick Morrison explained. The country must see us as a big, united, happy. What's the matter with that thing? The radio music had gone off abruptly. Choking on odd little gasps of static cut in the middle with a ringing phrase. It was 7.51. He shrugged and went on. Happy family. Hurry up, boys. Take close-ups of Mr. Thompson first. The hand of the clock was slicing off the minutes while press photographers clicked their cameras at Mr. Thompson's sour, impatient face. Mr. Thompson will sit between science and industry, Chick Morrison announced. Dr. Statler, please, the chair on Mr. Thompson's left. Miss Taggart, this way, please, on Mr. Thompson's right. Dr. Statler obeyed. She did not move. It's not just for the press, it's for the television audience, Chick Morrison explained to her. In a tone of inducement, she made a step forward. I will not take part in this program, she said, evenly addressing Mr. Thompson. You won't? He asked blankly, with the kind of look he would have worn if one of the flower vases had suddenly refused to perform its part. Dagny, for Christ's sakes, cried James Taggart in panic. What's the matter with her, Mr. Thompson? Asked Mr. Thompson. But, Miss Taggart, why? cried Chick Morrison. You all know why, she said to the faces around her. You should have known better than to try that again, Miss Taggart yelled Chick Morrison as she turned to go. If it's a national emer, then a man came rushing towards Mr. Thompson and stopped, as did everyone else, and the look on the man's face swept the crowd into abruptly total silence. He was the station chief's engineer, and it was odd to see a look of primitive terror struggling against his remnant of civilized control. Mr. Thompson, he said, we, we might have to delay the broadcast. What? cried Mr. Thompson. The hand of the dial stood at 7.58. 
We're trying to fix it, Mr. Thompson. We're trying to find out what it is. We might not be on time. And what are you talking about? What happened? We're trying to locate the what happened. I don't know. I don't know. We we can't get on the air, Mr. Thompson. There was another moment of silence when Mr. Thompson asked his voice unnaturally low. Are you crazy? I must be. I wish I were. I can't make it out. The station is dead. Mechanical trouble? Yelled Mr. Thompson, leaping to his feet. Mechanical trouble? God damn you. At a time like this? Is that how you came to run this station? The chief engineer shook his head slowly in a manner of an adult who is reluctant to frighten a child. It's not this station, Mr. Thompson, he said softly. It's every station in the country, as far as we've been able to check. And there is no mechanical trouble, neither here nor elsewhere. The equipment is in order and in perfect order. And they all report the same, but but all the radio stations went off the air at 7.51 and, and nobody can discover why. But, cried Mr. Thompson, stopped, glanced about him and screamed, not tonight, you can't let this happen tonight, you've got to get me on the air. Mr. Thompson, the man said slowly, we've called the electronic laboratory of the State Science Institute. They, they've never seen anything like it. They said it might be a natural phenomenon. Some sort of cosmic disturbance of an unprecedented kind. Only, well, only they don't think it is. We don't either. They said it looks like radio waves, but of a frequency never produced before, never observed anywhere, never discovered by anybody. No one answered him in a moment, and he went on, his voice oddly solemn. It looks like a wall of radio waves jamming the air and we can't get through it we can't touch it we can't break it and what's more we can't locate its source not by any other usual methods those waves seem to come from a transmitter that that makes any known to us look like a child's toy that's not possible the cry came from behind mr thompson and they all whirled in its direction startled by its note of peculiar terror it came from Dr. Stadler. There's no such thing. There's nobody on earth to make it. The chief engineer spread his hands out. That's it, Dr. Stadler. He said wearily, it can't be possible. It shouldn't be possible, but there it is. We'll do something about it, cried Mr. Thompson over the crowd at large. No one answered or moved. I won't permit this, cried Mr. Thompson. I won't permit it. Tonight, of all nights, I've got to make that speech do something. Solve it. Whatever it is, I order you to solve it. And the chief engineer was looking at him blankly. I'll fire the lot of you for this. I'll fire every electronic engineer in the country. I'll put the whole profession on trial for sabotage, desertion, and treason. Do you hear me? Now do something. God damn you, do something. And the chief engineer was looking at him impassively, as if words were not conveying anything any longer. Isn't there anybody around to obey an order, cried Mr. Thompson. Isn't there a brain left in this country? And the hand of the clock reached the dot of 8 p.m. The Abracast. Occult, history, conspiracy, and violence.
broadcasting from the TV, the drawing room TV set in the famous book Atlas Shrugged. I'm John Towers and this is the Abercast. Look, I want to do something kind of different and sort of special for the Democratic National Convention. And uh, I kind of zigged when I thought that I was going to zag. And I landed on doing a philosophy episode, double size, giant size philosophy episode. This evening, we're going to be talking about the book Atlas Shrugged by Ann Rand. So this podcast is a weekly podcast. We deal with the occult, history, conspiracy, and violence, as Hilla has explained to you. But... Uh, I do reserve the right to do bonus episodes that are episodes that are extra weekly. (laughs) They usually take the form of a Wednesday episode or a Friday episode. And I know that for some reason, Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrugged is a, a controversial book for, for people. Um, so this you know, if you don't want to listen to this, that's fine. That's fine. Um, come on back on Sunday and, uh, we'll be talking about, uh, you know, stuff we normally talk about, but we've been doing, uh, philosophy episodes for a long time. Now we went through all of Zarathustra. We talked about Plato and we talked about Epictetus and we talked about all, uh, Rene Descartes. We talked a lo- about a lot of philosophers. So uh, this evening, in the midst of this uh, Democratic National Convention, we're this is day one, where every speaker is going to be out there and they're going to be talking about raising your taxes to do everything. Provide free health care, health care for all, Medicare for all. To provide free education to people. To pay out reparations, to promote social justice causes, the Green New Deal, to open the borders, basic universal income, gun buybacks. So this is my peaceful protest. Isn't there anyone around to obey the order? Cried Mr. Thompson. Isn't there a brain left in this country? The hand of the clock reached the dot of 8 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, said a voice that came from the radio receiver, a man's clear, calm, implacable voice, the kind of voice that had not been heard on the airwaves for years. Mr. Thompson will not be speaking to you tonight. His time is up. I have taken it over. Reclaimed my time. If you you were to hear a report on the world crisis, that is what you are going to hear. Three grasps of recognition greeted the voice, but nobody had the power to notice them among the sounds of the crowd, which were beyond the stage of cries. One was a gasp of triumph. Another terror and the third of bewilderment. Three persons had recognized the speaker, Dagny, Dr. Stadler, and Eddie Weilers. Nobody glanced at Eddie Weilers, but Dagny and Dr. Stadler glanced at each other. She saw (laughs) that the face uh, was distorted by an evil terror as one could ever bear to see. He saw that she knew in that way she looked at him was if the speaker had slapped his face for 12 years you have been asking who is john galt this is john galt speaking i am the man who loves his life i am the man who does not sacrifice his love or his values i am the man who has deprived you of victims and thus has destroyed your world if you wish to know why you are perishing you who dread knowledge i am the man who will tell you
The chief engineer was the only one able to move. He ran to a television set and struggled frantically with his dials, but the screen remained empty. The speaker had uh, not chosen to be seen. Only his voice filled the airwaves of the country, of the world, thought the chief engineer, sounding as if he were speaking here in this room, not to a group, but to one man. It was not the tone of addressing a meeting, but the tone of addressing a mind. You have heard it said that this is an age of moral crisis. You have said it yourself, half in fear, half in hopes that the words had no meaning. You've cried that man's sins are destroying the world, and you have cursed human nature for its unwillingness to practice the virtues you demand. Since virtue to you consists of sacrifice, you have demanded more sacrifices at every successive disaster. In the name of a return to morality, you have sacrificed all those evils which you held as the cause of your plight. You have sacrificed justice to mercy. You have sacrificed independence to unity. You have sacrificed reason to faith, and you have sacrificed wealth to need. You have sacrificed self-esteem to self-denial, and you have sacrificed happiness to duty. You have deployed, uh, you have destroyed all that which you held to be evil, and achieved all that which you held to be good. Why then do you shrink in horror from the sight of the world around you? That world is not a product of your sins. It is a product and the image of your virtues. It is your moral idea brought into reality in its full and final uh, perfection. You have fought it. You have dreamt of it. You have wished it. And I... I am the man who granted you your wish. Your ideal has implaca- is, had an implacable enemy, which your code of morality was designed to destroy. And I have withdrawn that enemy. I have taken out. I've taken it out of your way and out of your reach. And I have removed the source of all those evils you were sacrificing one by one. And I have ended your battle. I have stopped your motor. I have deprived your world of man's mind. Men do not live by the mind, you say. I have withdrawn those who do. The mind is an imp- is impotent, you say. I have withdrawn those whose mind isn't. There are values higher than the mind, you say. I have withdrawn those for whom there weren't. While you were dragging your sacrificial altars, the men of justice, of injustice, of reason, of wealth, of self-esteem, I beat you to it. I reached them first and told them the nature of the game that you were playing, the nature of the moral code of yours, which they had been too innocently generous to grasp. I showed them the way to live by another morality, mine. It is mine that they choose to follow all the men who have vanished, the men you hated, the uh, yet dreaded to lose. It is I who have taken them away from you. Do not attempt to find us. We do not choose to be found. You do not cry that it is our duty to serve you. We do not recognize such duty. We do not cry that, uh, that you need us. We do not consider need a claim. Do not cry that you own us. You don't. Do not beg us to return. We are on strike. We, the men of the mind. We are on strike against self-immolation. We are on strike against the creed of unearned rewards and unrewarded duties. And we are on strike against the dogma that the pursuit 
of one's happiness is evil. We are on strike against the doctrine that life is guilt. There is a difference between our strike and all those you've practiced for centuries. Our strike consists not of making demands, but of granting them. We are evil according to your morality. We have chosen not to harm you any longer. We are useless according to your economics, but we have chosen not to exploit you any longer. We are dangerous and to be shackled according to your politics, and we have chosen not to endanger uh, nor to wear the shackles any longer. We are only an illusion according to your philosophy. We have chosen not to blind you any longer and have left you free to face reality, the reality you wanted. The world as you see it now, a world without mind. We have granted you everything you demanded of us. You, we who have always been the givers but have only now understood it. We have no demands to present to you, no terms to bargain about, no compromise to reach. You have nothing to offer us. We do not need you. Now you are crying. No, this was not what you wanted. A mindless world of ruins was not your goal. You do not want us to leave you, your moral cannibals. I know that you've always wanted what it was that you wanted, but your game is up. Because now we know it too. Through centuries of scourges and disasters brought about by your code of morality. You've cried that your code had been broken. That the scourges were punishments for breaking it. That men were too weak and too selfish to spill all the blood it required. You damned man. You damned existence. You damned this earth. But never dared to question your code. Your victims took the blame and struggled on in your curses as rewards for their martyrdom while you went on crying that your code was noble. But human nature was not good enough to practice it. No one rose to ask the question, good? By what standard? You want to know John Galt's identity? I am the man who has asked that question. Yes, in this age of moral crisis, yes, you are bearing punishment for your evil. It is not man who is now on trial. It is not human nature that will take the blame. It is your moral code that's through this time. Your moral, moral code has reached its climax, the blind alley at the end of its course. And if you wish to go on living, what you need is to return to morality. You have never known any. You need to discover it. You have heard no concepts of morality but the mythical or the social. You have been taught that morality is a code of behavior imposed on you by whim, the whim of a supernatural power or the whim of society to serve God's purpose or your neighborhood's welfare. To please an authority beyond the grave or else next door, but not to serve your life or pleasure. Your pleasure, you have been taught, is to be found in immorality. Your interest would be best served by evil. And any moral code that must be designed, not for you, but against you. Not to further your life, but to drain it. For centuries, the battle of morality was fought between those who claimed that your life belonged to God and 
those who claimed that it belongs to your neighbors, between those who preach that the good is self-sacrifice for the sake of ghosts in heaven, and those who preach that the good is self-sacrifice for the sake of incompetence on earth. No one came to, to say that your life belongs to you, and that the good is to live it. Both sides agree that morality demands the surrender of your self-interest and your mind and the moral and the practical are opposites. That morality is not the province of reason, but the province of faith and force. Both sides agree that no rational morality is possible, but there is no right and wrong in reason, and that in reason there is no reason to be moral. Whatever else they fought about, it was against man's mind that all your moralists have stood united. It was man's minds that all their schemes and systems were intended to deposit and destroy to despoil and destroy, now choose to perish or to learn that the anti-mind is the anti-life. A man's mind is his basic tool for survival. Life is given to him, survival is not. The body is given to him, its sustenance is not. His mind is given to him, its content is not. To remain alive he must act, and before he can act, he must know the nature and the purpose of his actions. He cannot obtain his food without a knowledge of food and of the way to attain it. He cannot dig a ditch or build a cyclotron without the knowledge of his aim and of the means to achieve it. To remain alive, he must think. But to think is an act of choice. The key to do, the key to what you so recklessly call human nature, the open secret you live with, yet dread to name, is the fact that man is a being of volitional unconsciousness. Reason does not work automatically. Thinking is not a mechanical process. The connections of logic are not made by instinct. The function of your stomach, lungs, or heart is automatic. The functions of your mind is not. In any hour, the issue of your life, you are free to think or to evade that <laughs> effort. But you are not free to escape from your nature, from the fact that reason is your means of survival. So that for you, who are a human being, the question uh, to be or not to be is the question, think or not to think. A being is a volitional consciousness that has no automatic course of behavior. He needs a code of values to guide his actions. Value is that which one acts to gain and to keep virtue is by the action one, uh, one gains and keeps it. Value presupposes an answer to the question of uh, value to whom and for what. Value presupposes a standard, a purpose, and a necessity of action. In the face of an alternative, where there are no alternatives, no values are possible. There is only one fundamental alternative in the universe, existence or non-existence. And it pertains to a single class of entities, to living organisms. The existence of inanimate matter is unconditional. The existence of life is not it depends on a specific course of action. Matter is indestructible. It changes its form, but it cannot cease to exist. It's only a living organism that faces a constant, that constant alternative. The issue of life and of death 
life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generating action. If an organism fails in that action, it dies. Its chemical elements remain, but its life goes out of existence. It's the only concept of life that makes the concept of value possible. It is only to a living entity that things can be good or evil. A plant must feed itself in order to live. The sunlight, the water, the chemicals it needs are the values its nature has set it to pursue. Its life is the standard of value directing its actions, but a plant has no choice of the action. There are alternatives in this uh, in the condition it encounters, but there is no alternative in its function. It acts automatically to further its life. It cannot act for its own destruction. An animal is equipped for sustaining its life. It, uh, its senses provide it with an automatic code of action, an automatic knowledge of what is good for it or evil. It has no power to extend its knowledge or to evade it. In conditions where its knowledge uh, proves inadequate, it dies. But so long as it lives, it acts on its knowledge with automatic safety and no power of choice. It is unable to ignore its own good. It's unable to decide to choose the evil and to act in its own destroyer, act as its own destroyer. Man has no automatic code of survival. It is particular uh, distinction from all other living species is the necessity to act in the face of alternatives by means of volitional choice. It has no automatic knowledge of what is good for him or evil, what values uh, his life depends on, what course of action it requires. Are you prattling about an instinct of self-preservation? An instinct of self-preservation is precisely what man does not possess. An instinct is an uh, unerring, automatic form of knowledge. A desire is not an instinct. A desire to live does not give you the knowledge required for living. And even man's desire to live is not automatic. Your secret evil today is that is desire for you, uh, desire you do not hold. Your fear of death is not a fear of love of life, and you will not give uh, the knowledge needed to keep it. Man must obtain his knowledge and um, choose by action, by the process of thinking each nature will not force him to perform to perform man has the power to act as his own destroyer and that is the way he has acted through most of his history a living entity that regarded its means of survival as evil would not survive a man that struggled to mangle its roots a bird that fought to break its wings would not remain for long in the existence they affronted. The history of man has been a struggle to deny and to destroy his mind. Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. Man has been called a rational being, but rationality is a matter of choice. And the alternative his, uh, his nature offers him is... 
rational being or suicidal animal. Man has to be a man by choice. He has to hold uh, his life as a value by choice. He has to learn to sustain it by choice. He has to discover the values it requires and practice his virtues by choice. A code of values accepted by choice is a code of morality. Whoever you are, you who are hearing me now, I'm speaking to whatever living remnant is left uncorrupted within you, to the remnant of the human in your mind. And I say, there is a morality of reason, a morality proper to man and man's life. It is standard uh Life is its standard of value. All that which is proper to the life of a rational being is the good. All that which destroys it is evil. Man's life is required by his nature. It is not the life of a mind less brute, of looting, of a looting thug or a mooching mystic, but the life of a thinking being. Not life by means of force or fraud, but life by means of achievement, not survival at any price, since there is only one price that pays for a man's survival, reason. Man's life is the standard of morality, but your own life is its purpose. The existence on earth is your goal, but you must choose your actions and values by the standards of that which is proper to man for the purpose of preserving, fulfilling, and enjoying the irreplaceable value which is your life. Since life requires a specific course of action, any other course will destroy it. A being who does not hold his own life as the motive and goal of his actions is acting on a motive and standard of death. Such a being is a metaf metaphysical monstrosity, struggling to oppose, negate, and constrict the fact of his own existence, running blindly amok on a trail of destruction capable of nothing but pain. Happiness is a successful state of life. Pain is an agent of death. Happiness is the state of consciousness which proceeds from the achievement of one's values, a morality that dares to tell you to find happiness in the uh, renunction of your happiness. The value of uh, failure in your work is an insolent negation of morality. And the doctrine that gives you, as an ideal, the role of the sacrificial animal, seeking slaughter on the altar of others. <sighs> seeking slaughter on the altar of others is giving you death as your standard. By the grace of reality and the nature of life, Man, every man is an end in himself. He exists for his own sake, and the achievement of his own happiness is his high and moral purpose. But whether life nor happiness can be achieved by the pursuit of irrational whims, just as man is free to attempt to survive in any random manner, but he will perish unless he lives as his nature requires. So he is free to seek out his happiness in any mindless fraud, but the torture of frustration is all he will find unless he seeks the uh, happiness proper to man. The purpose of morality is to teach you not to suffer and die, but to enjoy yourself and live. Sweep aside those parasites of subsidized classrooms who live on the profits of the mind of others and proclaim that man needs no morality, no values, no code of behavior. They who pose as scientists and claim that man is only an animal 
do not grant him inclusion into the law of existence they have granted to the lowest of insects. Ha! They recognize that every living species has a way of survival demanded by its nature. They do not claim that a fish can live out of water or that a dog can live without its sense of smell. But man, they claim, the most complex of beings, man can survive in any way, whatever. Man has no identity, no nature. There's no practical reason why he cannot live with his means of survival destroyed, but his mind throttled and placed into the disposal of others they might care to issue. Sweep aside the uh, those hatred-eaten mystics who pose as friends of humanity and preach that the highest virtue of man can practice is to hold his own life as of no value. Do they tell you that the purpose of morality is to curb man's instinct of self-preservation? It is for this purpose of self-preservation that man needs a code of morality. The only man who desires to be moral is the man who desires to live. No, you do not have to live. It is your basic act of choice. But if you choose to live, you must live as a man by the work and the judgment of your mind. No, you do not have to live as a man. It is an act of moral choice, but you cannot live as anything else. Oh, boy. <laughs> and it is uh, alternative is that the state of living death, which you now see within you and around you, the state of a thing unfit for existence, no longer human and less than an animal. A thing that knows nothing but pain and drags itself through its span of years into the agony of unthinkable self-destruction. No, you do not have to think it is an act of moral choice, but someone had to think to keep you alive if you choose a default, you default on existence and you pass the deficit to some moral man expecting him to sacrifice his goods for the sake of letting you survive by your evil. No, you do not have to be a man, but today those who are are not there any longer. I have removed your means of survival, your victims. If you wish to know how I have done this and what I told them to make them quit, you're hearing it now. I told them, in essence, the statement I am making tonight. They were men who have lived by my code, but have not known how great a virtue it represented. I made them see it. I brought them not a reevaluation, but only an identification of their values. We, the men of the mind, are now on strike against you. In the name of a single axiom, which is the root of our moral code, the root of yours as we wish to escape it, the axiom that existence exists. Existence exists. And the act of grasping that statement implies two corollary axioms. That something exists which one perceives, and that one exists possessing consciousness, consciousness being the uh, faculty of perceiving that which exists. If nothing exists, there can be no consciousness. A consciousness with nothing to be conscious of is a contradiction in terms. And a, a consciousness conscious of nothing but itself is a contradiction in terms. Before it could identify itself as uh, consciousness, it has to be conscious of something. If that which you claim to perceive does not exist, then what you possess is not consciousness. Whatever the degree of your knowledge of these two, the existence of consciousness, are axioms, you cannot escape. These two are the irreducible primaries. 
is implied in any action you undertake in any part of your knowledge and it sums from the first ray of light you perceive at the start of your life to the wildest iridation you might acquire at its end. Whether you know the shape of a pebble or the structure of the sol solar system, the axiom remains the same, that it exists and that you know it. The <laughs> to, ex <laughs> to exist is to be something as distinguished from the nothing of non-existence. It is to be an entity of specific nature made of specific attributes centuries ago. The man who was, no matter what his errors, the greatest of your philosophers stated the formula of defining the concept of existence and the rule of all knowledge. A is A. Another way to say this is it is what it is, right? A, a thing is itself. You have never grasped the meaning of this statement I am here to complete it. Existence is identity. Consciousness is identification. Whatever you... Whatever you uh, choose to consider, be it an object and attribute or an action, the law of identity remains the same. A leaf cannot be a stone. At the same time, it cannot be all red and green. At the same time, it cannot freeze and burn. At the same time, A is A. Or if you wish, stated in a simpler language, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. Are you seeking to know what is wrong with the world? All the disasters that have wrecked your world? came from your leader's attempt to evade the fact that A is A. All the secret evil you dreaded to face within you and all your pain you have endured come from your own attempt to evade the fact that A is A. The purpose of those who taught you to evade it was to make you forget that man is man. Man cannot survive by gaining knowledge, and reason is his only means to gain it. Reason is the faculty that perceives, identifies, and integrates the material provided by his senses. The task of his senses is to give him the evidence of existence, but the task of identifying it belongs to his reason. His senses tell him only that something is, but what it is must be learned by his mind. All thinking is a process of identification and integration. Man perceives a blob of color, and by integrating the evidence of his sight and of his uh, touch, he learns to identify it as a solid object. He learns to identify the object as a table. He learns that the table is made of wood, and he learns that the wood consists of cells. The cells consist of molecules, and the molecules consist of atoms, and all through this process, the work of his mind consists of answers to a single question. What is it? His means to establish the truth of his answers is logic, and the logic rests on the axiom of the existence the existence exists. Logic is the art of non contradictory identification. A contradiction cannot exist. An atom is itself and so is the universe. <laughs> Neither can contradict its own identity, nor can a part contradict the whole. No concept man forms is valid unless he integrates it with a contradiction into his total sum of his knowledge. To arrive at a contradiction is to confess an error in one's thinking. To maintain a contradiction is to abdicate one's mind and to evict oneself from the realm of reality. Reality is that which exists. The unreal does not exist. The unreal is merely that uh, negation of existence, which is the content of 
human consciousness. When it attempts to abandon reason, truth is the recognition of reality. Reason, man's only mean of knowledge, is his only standard for truth. The most depraved sentence you can now utter is to ask, whose reason? And the answer is, yours. This is why her philosophy is called objectivism, by the way. (laughs) No matter how vast your knowledge or how modest, it is your own mind that has to acquire it. It is only with your own knowledge that you can deal. It is only your own knowledge that you can claim to possess or to ask others to consider. Your mind is your only judge of truth. And if others dissent from your verdict, reality is the court of final appeal. Nothing but a man's mind can perform the complex, delicate, crucial process of identification, which is thinking. Nothing can direct the process but his own judgment. Nothing can direct his judgment but his moral integrity. You who speak of moral instinct as if it were some separate endowment opposed to reason. Man's reason is his moral faculty. A process of reason. It is a process of constant choice in answer to the question true or false right or wrong is man's wound to be disinfected in order to save his life right or wrong does the nature of atmospheric electricity prevent it to be converted into kinetic power right or wrong is the answer to such questions that gave you everything that you have. And an answer comes from a man's mind, a mind of intransient devotion to that which is right. A rational process is a moral process. You may make an error at any step of it. Nothing to protect you but your own severity. You may try to cheat, to fake the evidence, the evade, the effort, the effort of the quest. Uh, But if devotion to truth is the hallmark of morality, then there is no greater, nobler, more heroic form of devotion than, um, than the act of the man who assumes the responsibility for thinking. That which you call your soul or your spirit or your consciousness and that which you call free will is your mind's freedom to think or not. The only will you have, your only freedom, the choice controls all the choices you make and determines your life and your character. Thinking is a man's only basic virtue from which all the others proceed and his basic vice the source of all his evils is that nameless act which all of you practice but struggle never to admit the act of blanking out the willful suspension of one's consciousness the refusal to think not blindness the refusal to see not ignorance the refusal to know It is the act of unfocusing your mind and inducing an inner fog to escape the responsibility of judgment. The unstated premise that a thing will not exist if only you refuse to identify it. That A will not be A. So long as you do not pronounce the verdict, it is. Non-thinking is an act of annihilation, a wish to negate existence, an attempt to wipe out reality. But existence exists. Reality is not to be wiped out. It will merely wipe out the wiper by refusing to say it is. You are refusing to say I am. By suspending your own judgment, you are negating your person. When a man declares who am I to know? 
He is declaring, who am I to live? This, in every hour, every issue, is your basic moral choice. Thinking or non-thinking. Existence or non-existence. A or non-A in identity or zero. To the extent to which a man is rational, life is the premise directing his actions. To the extent to which he is irrational, the premise directing his actions is death. You who prattle that morality is social and that man would need no morality on a desert island. It is on a desert island that he would need it the most. Let him try to claim when there is no victim to pay for it. That a rock is a house. That sand is clothing. That food will drop into his mouth without cause or effort. That he will collect a harvest tomorrow by devouring his stock of seeds today. In reality, will wipe him out. As he deserves, reality will show him that life is a value to be bought. That thinking is the only coin noble enough to buy it. If we were to speak your kind of language, I would say that a man's own moral commandment is, Thou shalt think. But a moral commandment is a contradiction in terms moral is chosen, not forced. The understood, not obeyed. The moral is the rational. The reason accepts no commandments. My morality, the morality of reason, is contained in a single axiom. Existence exists. And then a single choice to live. The rest proceeds from these. To live, man must hold three things in supreme ruling values of his life. Reason, purpose, self-esteem. Reason is his only tool of knowledge. Pur purpose is his choice of happiness, which that tool must proceed to achieve. Self-esteem as an invalid certainty that his mind is competent to think and his person is worthy of happiness and this means is worthy of living these three values imply and require all of man's values and his values pertain to the relation of existence and consciousness rationality independence integrity honesty justice productiveness and pride Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a five-star rate and review. Hey, did you learn something? Did you laugh? Supporting me is a way for you to be a part of the Abercast and ensure its growth and sustainability. It also means I can create a normal schedule for shows and bonus shows, as well as the exclusive fellow craft episodes. By supporting the show, you are not only a listener, but you are a part of the show. You supporting the show gives me a way to offer fun rewards as a thank you for showing your appreciation and support for our projects. Do you have an idea for a reward that you don't see? Let me know. My supporters are my partners. I currently pay for you to listen to the Abercast. Not only do I pay the hosting bills out of my own pocket, I volunteer my time and uh, talent to each and every episode of the Abercast. The price of books, the time and resources of reading and researching, the massive amounts of gin and tonic needed, the equipment it takes to record the shows, the time and resources it takes to create the bonus material, and the cost to maintain the internet presence. Is it worth your support? I don't know. I am proud of the Abercast, and I feel like I'm improving all the time. In addition uh, to creating the show that you dig, and that you are excited about, 
I also have a full-time commitment and other obligations. So why financial support? All of the supporters help me focus my time in on the quality and development of the podcast. And what if you can't afford, you know, $1 or $3 or $10 or whatever a month? Believe me, I get that. There are many degrees of support, but if you can't support the show financially, please consider leaving a five-star rate and review on your preferred podcast app. And don't forget that you could sign into the mailing list and still unlock a lot of bonus content. Thank you. I cannot put into words how much it means to me that you listen to the show each time I post a new episode. Your feedback support, and love of the stories that we talk about here is what keeps me going. 